welcome to A Life Less Ordinary, hosted by me, Sophie Elwes. In this podcast, I'll be interviewing people who have overcome huge challenges and finding out what tips and tricks they can share for other people who might be facing challenges of their own. I was beyond excited when my guest this week agreed to come on my podcast. I heard his story a few years ago, and it completely stopped me in my tracks. Former crack addict, drug dealer, and young offender, Brett Moran is a prime example of overcoming adversity and demonstrates how light can be found in the darkest of situations. He's now a published author, life coach, and meditation and yoga instructor. I absolutely loved our conversation and had a grin from ear to ear for most of it. Both of us have faced adversity, albeit in very different forms, and we found we actually had a lot more in common than we realised. We speak about the victim complex, taming that monkey mind that many of us know well, and Brett shares some valuable lessons that definitely taught me a thing or two. Brett lives in Thailand, so we recorded this remotely while he was beside the beach, which you can hear from the birds in the distance. I really hope you enjoy this one. Brett, how are you doing? I'm amazing, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not bad, not bad. Thank you so much for doing this. Can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Uh, you're so welcome. I'm, I'm, I feel very grateful that you asked. So it's, I'm excited to inspire. So yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, wicked, wicked. Like the sound of that. So I came across you a few years ago. I was listening to another podcast and um, I just remember, like, I think I was sitting in the car and I think I, I, I even pulled over or something. I don't just really, really stuck with me, your story. And it just blew me away. So I'm so, so chuffed you're up for this. And, you know, I have the opportunity to share share your story and, you know, your message with some more people. Amazing. Um, so take me back a little bit. Tell me your story. Would you introduce yourself for us, please? Yeah, yeah, cool. So my name is Brett, obviously. And to take you back, I started my life off uh, on a very different path from where I am now. I was a young little monkey. I was a mischievous little child and I grew up on a council estate and that kind of like naughty little streak inside me inevitably led me to get into some kind of troubles, let's just say. And I started to experiment with like um, soft drugs, like smoking some puff and some weed. And to be really honest with you, like, I enjoyed it. I was having a great time. And I took my first ecstasy tablet, went to Ibiza and just partied. And I thought like taking drugs and being a little rebellious monkey was amazing. It was great. So I enjoyed it. And then uh, unfortunately, the drugs kind of got a little bit heavier and somebody introduced me to crack. And then I started to smoke crack and then I started dealing as well. And yeah, as soon as I started doing that and dealing cocaine, my fun and my love for that kind of lifestyle and drugs just disappeared. Just got very paranoid very depressed um, but I was addicted to it and I just couldn't stop taking it so inevitably I ended up in prison I had loads of criminal records just for silly things you know I wasn't a bad person but I just always got caught up in silly things and I ended up in prison and I went to a, a prison called High Down just on the outskirts well quite far out of London sort of on the south side and I uh, ended up in prison and as crazy as it sounds prison was the best thing that ever happened to me on my um, first prison sentence I found a book on meditation. And the book, I was actually in the prison library waiting for some guy to drop off some drugs in the prison library because that's where you had to meet people to get drugs. So he was meeting me from a different wing and I was in the prison library. I don't, up until that point, I think I've only ever read one book in my life. I just, I didn't enjoy reading. I left school at about 15, 16 without any education. I had no time for school. I just wanted to party and have fun. So there I am in the, in the prison library pretending that I'm looking for some kind of book to, to ponder over. And this guy, he didn't turn up. Like, he never turned up with the drugs. I don't know what happened. I never actually saw him again. But he never turned up. And then just as I was about to leave the prison, some book just, like, literally, randomly fell off the shelf. And I just picked this book up. And it was called Moment by Moment by Jerry Brazar. And the book was just literally a book on mindfulness and meditation. And if I'm honest, like... Coming from a council state, my dad was a racist football hooligan and I used to go to all these football matches with my dad and chant out all these racist remarks in the in the terraces at football, take drugs with my dad. So when I picked a book up on mindfulness and meditation, I thought it was some, you know, religious cult and a load of rubbish, if I'm honest. And I was a bit embarrassed, like because for some weird reason the book just gripped me in that prison library. I just looked at it and I can't even remember what page I read, but I just read like a couple of like quotes or pages or, or sentences and I just felt calm. And as, as crazy as it sounds, while I was in that prison library, I just for a moment, I just felt free. 
and maybe I just entered the book somehow. And yeah, so I took the book from the prison library, went back to my cell. I didn't tell anybody I was reading it because again, I come from a very different background and I thought people would, you know, either take the piss out of me for going down this religious sort of spiritual path. And then, so I went back to my prison cell and I just literally read it in private and I just started practicing meditation. You know, I'm not Buddhist now, I'm not religious whatsoever, but I loved just how simple that Buddhism was and just it said, focus on your breath. And and from what I get from it now, after all these years, I can look back is that it just, I realized that I wasn't these thoughts and these stories inside my head. I wasn't these emotions that were making me feel suicidal and depressed. And I wasn't even my actions and my behaviors. It doesn't condone what I was doing, but there was something deeper going underneath. And I called it in my book, a hole in the soul. And so I think prison was the best thing that happened to me because in a weird way, it was like my first retreat, although there was no yoga and no coconuts, but it was like a a retreat (laughs) for me. And I just, I I, I had nowhere to go. I was on a proper lockdown, which is like, I feel like what happened in the last few months for the world, it's like, you know, the universe has got everybody to go on a retreat to look at themselves and maybe reevaluate life. And so I'm just very blessed that that happened to me so many years ago because throughout this lockdown everybody's kind of panicking and complaining I'm like this has just been normal for me like just to be on my own and self-study and I really owe that to that time that I was sentenced to prison because obviously you're locked in your cell you can't go anywhere you're literally locked in this room and I actually found in that prison cell freedom I know it sounds crazy but I I actually set myself free because I realized that the real prison was the one inside your head Um, And now, you know, I'm a private coach, I'm a yoga instructor, and I work with people, I do retreats and transformational stuff. And most people have never even committed a crime, they've never even been in prison, but they're doing a sentence inside their head, with all these negative thoughts, these stories, and these limiting beliefs. And so for me now, the real prison is the one inside your head. So I'm very grateful, actually, I know it sounds crazy, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me that I went to prison. Now, I didn't change overnight, if I'm honest. I never I never came out of prison and I was enlightened like some Gandhi and floated. I actually went back to prison about six months later. I carried on smoking crack. But in that moment of being in prison and meditating and doing the things that I started to do, it just started to create some awareness in my mind that if you keep doing that, you're going to feel you're going to feel shit or you're going to feel depressed. And now if you start doing something new and better for your life. And I know it sounds really simple, but it is. It's common sense, but it's just not common practice. So I just started listening to that voice, that intuition, that voice of awareness. And, and again, it's taken me years, like years to, to trust it, to cultivate it. It didn't happen overnight. But I suppose my only message I would say to anybody, like whether it's depression, anxiety, prison, addiction, I think those rock bottoms in our lives can actually turn out to be the biggest gifts. And for me, it was. Yeah. I love that you say that. I find that so interesting. And I, I can, you know, in some ways relate to it, that idea of something so huge and so sort of devastating to so many people. You know, obviously, what happened to me, you know, I had a spinal cord injury, became paralyzed sort of nine years ago. And I've said since I wouldn't change it for the world. For a lot of people, that sort of thing is, it's awful. It's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. But to me, it's a total blessing. And it's given me a lot of insight and perspective. So I can understand. I mean, it's completely different and I can't imagine what being in prison is like. But yeah, it's so interesting that you say that. It's sort of the best thing that ever happened to you. What, what do you think is the difference then between somebody like with yourself with a spinal injury or somebody like me that's gone to prison and then they turn it around in the positives? Like, what do you think the difference is for you? I mean, I think for me, you know, it's really taught me about the value of life and really you know when people ever say to me like what what sort of advice would you have or what what has helped you through those hard times is really being grateful is finding the good in a bad situation you know there's things that happen to you it's hard you know being in a wheelchair really sucks sometimes but if you can look at the good in it and what you can learn that is the most powerful thing of all for me and I know you talk about gratitude a lot as well yeah, no, no, I agree. So, so sorry, Sophie, mate. Just so you, you're in a wheelchair then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. For life, like I, I fell off a roof terrace nine years ago. Had a party, South London. Went to hospital, six months in hospital, coma, all that stuff. Bad times for the family and things. Like you, it's taken time. It really wow. has. But now I've genuinely never been happier. Like I've living my best life in a wheelchair you know this podcast just got 10 times better I love you so much like (laughs) thank you for sharing like like you're interviewing me or whatever but I feel (laughs) to listen to you and your story and the way that you've turned it around I've got goosebumps all up my arms (laughs) oh well it's gonna be a good chat I can see this 
Honestly, Brett, the things that you do, I don't know how long ago you started doing your Instagram lives in the morning. You do a live meditation every morning at nine o'clock. And I've been really interested in meditation and mindfulness for a long time. I read about it, but I've really struggled to engage with it and genuinely get into that zone. And really truthfully, your meditations in the morning, for the last couple of weeks, I've done them sort of most mornings. And after that, I feel light. I feel lifted. You know, on any of the apps, anything like that, I've never been able to do it like I have been able. And genuinely, I, it, it's incredible what you're doing for so many people. And I hope more people will will hear it. That's amazing. And likewise, mate, likewise. So I really appreciate it. We're in it together, right? It's like, I think what you've just said there, like you can be in a wheelchair or you can be in prison or you can, we've all got a different life story. And I do believe that we're all going to go through something like that's just life, whatever the story is. And I think in a way, like it's a gift for us to be able to turn that around. So while I was in prison, like, uh, again, I don't believe in a man in the sky with a big beard that controls everything, but I do believe in some kind of higher power. And I just kind of remember just saying, like, like, if you help me out, I'll give it back. <laughs> and so I just, to be honest with you, mate, I just feel like I'm just sharing the freedom that I've got. And I can see that in you. You're just sharing that gratitude. You know, you're just like, wow, it makes you reassess how amazing life is, even if the situation isn't 100%. But you can just then share that with others to just inspire that hope. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's priceless. I, I actually get a buzz from sharing it. So everyone's like, oh, thanks for the meditation and, and all that. And thanks for the book. And I'm just like... You don't understand. I think I'm getting more from it than everyone else. <laughs> I'm buzzing without the drugs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. And like, you know, accessing that sort of high as well. Like I'm sort of reading your book at the moment, which honestly, I really recommend to everyone. <laughs> I've got a list here of stuff I want to talk about. There is so much that I want to cover with you. There's not enough time in this episode. We have to do but... another one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But like something I think in the podcast that I originally listened to you with and, and something you talk about in your book is about the monkey mind and taking control of your mind and stuff. And that really resonated with me. And that's something I struggle with. And I think most people do dispelling those negative thoughts. Tell me about dealing with that. Yeah. Okay. So I think the best way to describe it, there's a story about hunters in Indonesia and the way hunters catch monkeys is they get this, say, for example, a coconut and they empty out all the juice of the coconut and then they will drill the coconut to like say a tree or something and then they cut the top off of it and they put some sweets like bananas or something sweet inside this coconut and then what happens is the monkey you know they can smell for miles they smell the sweets and these monkeys will come along in the jungle and they will put their hand inside the coconut and they will grab the sweet but because the monkey has created a fist you know it's clinging on it's clutching on to this sweet the monkey can't pull its hand back out of the coconut the trap but the monkey isn't that intelligent enough to know that all the monkey needs to do is just open its hand and let go. And if the monkey could open its hand and let go, it could release his arm and it wouldn't be free. So the monkey clings on and then obviously the hunters come along and they grab the monkey. And I think that's like all of us. You know, we cling on to these stories of I'm not good enough. We cling on to our addictions. We cling on to our anxiety. You could cling on to that story that I'm stuck in a wheelchair. This is not fair. Why me? I'm only young. And I'm sure you probably have some stuff and I have some stuff that comes up for me, you know. And I think the trick is to really remember that all we need to do is just let go of that story for a moment. And I know I say just let go because some of them are intense. But the art for me of waking up and being free is realizing that you are that monkey <laughs> trapped in that trap. And the only thing that's keeping you trapped is your grip. And if you can just let go of that clutch, of that clinging on to the story, you can set yourself free. And again, my mind still wanders. I don't meditate to be some kind of hippie and think I'm enlightened. I meditate because my mind is crazy. If I, if I didn't meditate, I'd probably still be taking drugs and doing crazy stuff. Obviously, I go into bliss, I go into peace, and I go into love. But sometimes I still wake up and the monkey mind wants to cling on to something. It wants to grab onto a story. It wants to have a, a scenario or conversation in my head. But now I've got this tool just to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's just let go for a moment. Let's just let go. It's okay. And I think that, to me, is probably one of the best tools I, I, I feel like I've got in my toolbox. And then, obviously, is love. You know, you, you don't want to be hard on yourself and like judge yourself for talking to yourself in a bad way you want to start to love that little monkey and trust me I have got a very very cheeky little mischievous monkey in my head <laughs> but now I just love him and one thing I say to my clients if they've got things like anxiety or depression the yogis they say be comfortable in your discomfort and so many of us are trying to avoid 
comfortable. We're, we're, we're like buying something new so we can feel better. We're changing how we look. We're getting more makeup. Guys are wearing more clothes. We're buying new cars. We're constantly doing things externally because deep inside we feel this discomfort which we want to avoid. And so for me, like again, being in prison was the best thing. Like I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't buy anything. I couldn't drink anything. Couldn't sleep with anybody. I had to just stop and sit with that discomfort of I hate myself. I want to kill myself. And as weird as it sounds, there was a little moment where I just started to sort of like go, well, come on, mate, let's love ourselves a little bit. Let's, you know, let's just do that. So what I say to my clients now is like, rather than trying to avoid anxiety, rather than trying to avoid a sensation or a load of horrible thoughts inside your head, like welcome it in for a cup of tea, just like you welcome your best friend in and just say, hello, fear, hello, anxiety. How are you today? What are you afraid of? You know, why do you feel this way? And I promise you, so for like just doing that technique over the years, it's just, it just shrinks that stuff because it's like, oh, you haven't given it any kind of energy. It loses its power over you. And I think the game really is just winning this inner game with yourself, mastering yourself because you'll never beat the system. You'll never change anyone else. You can only master yourself. But when you master yourself, you beat the system and you start changing people just by being you, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Because this is a podcast, people won't be able to see the massive smile on my face. Like so much of what you've just said just resonates with me so much. I love the idea of being comfortable with your discomfort. I think that's such a vital thing for people to really grapple with. I think for me, getting out of my comfort zone is something that's so important for me and has been in my journey. Because if I was to stay in my comfort zone, this new girl who's in a wheelchair who didn't want to sort of push herself or whatever, I would be in that bubble. But because I've been able to sort of step out and I am embrace that discomfort, I, you know, I'll take on a challenge because, you know, even if it's something that I'm scared of or whatever, it pushes you. And that's how you grow, I think. Yeah. And in the same way in your mind sort of accepting those thoughts and that monkey mind but kind of loving it yeah and I agree I agree you've got a massive smile on your face it's beautiful (laughs) no it's amazing (laughs) that's amazing something before you know we were talking about that thing about adversity and it being the sort of best thing to happen to you something that came to me is really the idea that no matter what your life situation is about no matter what story has been dictated by your upbringing or what happens to you your parents or whatever you said something before about actually if you can access this part of your mind that higher power which I'm definitely still working on and I need to keep meditating with you in order to access it I think but I think the ability to access that part of your mind it doesn't matter what you've been through what you look like what your body can do you know what your background is right like it, it can kind of override that I think yeah, I think so. I think what you're talking about, and we just call it consciousness, which really is a simple word for awareness. Go. Yeah, yeah. Consciousness is awareness. And never let these big words or these kind of things put us off, but simply means it's awareness. And if we just, first of all, become so aware that our brain is just like this computer that we're talking on, and it is programmed to do a certain thing, which is cool, right? And then over time, I'll save loads of photos, I'll save loads of videos. And then all of a sudden, all of my data in my computer is blogged up and my computer gets tired and it's exhausted and I've got no more memory in my computer. Look at society, like so many human beings, they're just robots, bless them. And I'm not saying that from judgment because of my heart and my passion is about helping people wake up, but their computers are completely full up. Now, the thing is, and let's say that's all like memories. Instead of videos and photos, it's like their memories, it's their programs, it's their beliefs. The thing is that 95% of that stuff, they never even picked it. In the first 10 years of our lives, we get programmed with all of that stuff. And then that affects our relationships, the amount of money that we make, the amount of health that we've got, our attitude, whether we've got a positive mental health or a negative mental health, positive self-esteem, low self-worth. And so the first thing I think to access that higher level of consciousness, which is just awareness, is to really become aware and become awake that who you think you are and all the shit, pardon my language, (laughs) all the stuff that you're doing really is literally just a bunch of programs that you never picked. And to me, like I just went to my dad, bless him, his, his wife passed away a couple of weeks ago. I went to my dad's wife's funeral, traumatic event. She was on a motorbike. She got hit. And she died instantly. We live in Thailand. So my dad's married to a Thai woman. So I went up to North Thailand. I sat with my dad and just went for three days of this funeral. Um, So it's a Buddhist funeral where they burn the body. They take the bones. They do these ceremonies. It goes on and on and on. And it was very awakening for me to see that. But one thing I got from that, like, you know, it's inevitable that you're going to die. 
Like you can't get out of that. Like we're all going to die. It's inevitable that this body is beautiful, but it can break. It can get injured, et cetera, et cetera. And so death, it doesn't really scare me. But what scared me more, what inspires me more to help people wake up is that the scariest thing is that people believe in all of those programs in their head. And in a way, they're kind of like living this kind of life, which is just an illusion. And they're being triggered by all these programs and all of the fear and the anxieties in the news and the media. And I think that to me is a bigger fear than actually dying because dying is part of the process whether it's traumatic and it happens instantly whether you have a really beautiful life and you have a great life but you no one's going to get out of that one that's like inevitable so in a way death is a reminder really enjoy your life and live but most people are not living because of all of those programs that they never picked they never chose the amount of money that they're earning they never chose the emotions that they're feeling they never chose the limiting beliefs that are inside their head so before we even go to that higher level of consciousness, we just have to get bloody real. Like we have to wake up and go, why am I doing what I'm doing? Do I enjoy what I'm doing? And if I don't, how on earth do I change this? If I can't do it on my own, I'll go and find a coach. If I can't do the coaching, I'll read a book. I think that's the first step in any transformation is the awareness. Then when you're meditating and you go on that path, I honestly, truly believe that there is some kind of energy. I'm not going to call it a higher power of God, but there is just something special and beautiful in this universe, like a power, a light. And when you get on that path, it starts to guide you in some way. And organically and naturally, you will start to remove those programs and your life will just start to unfold beautifully. Mm. And that's the only way I can describe it. And and that higher power, it just starts, or that energy, like you said, accessing that kind of level of consciousness, it just starts to work through you, mate. To me, it's so simple that we've made it so bloody complicated and maybe that's what they wanted. Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? I think there are so many distractions in the world. We are all chasing that instant kind of gratification, social media, chasing those things that we think make us happy. I guess we're sort of distracted by what's going on around the world. We lose sight of what what is really important and what brings us that Mm. joy, true, true joy and getting 100 likes on Instagram or whatever. It's a buzz. It's not really real joy and happiness. Yeah. Yeah. I've just spent my day, Sophie, watching the ants and butterflies on on the beach where I live. And that to me is like, trust me, I took a lot of drugs to get some kind of high years ago. And now I'm just just watching the ants because I think back to the analogy like the the ones that's programmed that's and and again it's not a judgment but it's it's like a lower level of thinking you will only think what that computer has been programmed to do this higher level of consciousness takes you to a higher level of thinking which is more joy happiness peace and then those higher levels of thinking with this awareness then starts creating higher levels of feeling and your feelings Mm. i don't know about anybody else on this planet but at the end of the day the most important things is how we think and feel you can have all the money you can have all of the likes you can be on the beach even and have a beautiful house overlooking the ocean but if you don't think positive and if you're not feeling right you're going to self-destruct and you're not going to enjoy all of these riches so i would say master that inner game tune those higher those thoughts and those feelings to that higher vibration which is just a feeling or a thought then you can still have all the likes you can still have all the fame you can have the house on the beach and you just you're not attached to it you just enjoy it because it's there but it's not like an attachment to it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I hear you for sure. Something that I think you touched on in your book that I'm particularly interested in is the idea of the victim complex. And going from from my story and what happened to me, I've spoken to a lot of people and they a lot of them will say, like, if that happened to me, that would be game over or whatever. And I work for a charity and I speak to a lot of newly injured people. And it varies so, so much. But the thing that the people who are dealing with it the best, they make a choice to not be a victim, basically. And there are so, so many people. And it really doesn't matter about level of injury, really. I speak to a lot of people with really high, you know, who've broken their necks, you know, paralyzed from the neck down. And so many people I know in that situation have such a great attitude and they don't see themselves as a victim. And a lot of people who don't have a disability or or who don't have anything sort of physically wrong with them, they sort of adopt this victim complex. And I find that really interesting. What are your thoughts about that? And, And if people listening can relate to that and see themselves as a victim about whatever has is going on in their lives, how do you kind of escape that, do you think? Yeah, I suppose I, just my question is, what is it that you find interesting about it? Oh, right <laughs> back at you. <laughs> I think it's basically the fact that it's a choice that you can make. And 
if I was to see myself as a victim, and for sure I have done, and, and in the past, you know, right at the beginning, dark times. But I think we all have an ability to make a choice. And if you choose to see yourself as a victim, that can completely suffocate you. That's how you identify yourself as a victim. Your life is dictated and it will follow this path. But if you can get out of that and see yourself actually, you know, as as grateful for what's happened or, you know, not a victim, a champion instead of a victim, then you can access so much more, you know, not just in terms of disability. That's my experience of it anyway. But I think if you have an open mind and, yeah, you don't see yourself as a victim. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I totally agree. I just I find it interesting to, to to find out what makes it tick for you. So thank you. Great answer. I think there's a great quote. I think it's Bob Proctor. He says, people with limited minds will live limited lives. So if you've got a limited mind, i.e. if you're programmed with all these limitations and this lack and this victim consciousness or victim kind of mentality, then you are only ever going to create that kind of life. You can't have what you want if you've got that. And Jack Canfield in his book, uh, The Success Principles, the first chapter. I love that book. (laughs) So good. So accessible. I found out about Law of Attraction a few years ago and I was sort of, you know, I was really interested in it and it sort of rung a little bit of a bell with me. And I I read a few books, listened to some audio books, but that one, The Success Principles, was just so accessible and it made so, I love it. It's amazing. The first chapter in that book, it literally is about, it's just take full responsibility take full responsibility. So when I get these little kind of, for me personally, like you was asking about that victim consciousness or stuff, like I go off and test it with myself. Like I would never share meditation with somebody if it didn't work for me. Like I wouldn't say to everybody, look, I haven't drunk alcohol for 12 years. I haven't taken drugs for 12 years. I don't eat meat. I've turned into a bloody vegan yogi with a man bun on my head. But I tell you something, I'm absolutely buzzing off my tits. I am, I've never felt so high and free and happy. And so now I know that this works. Do you know what I mean? I know if you sit down and regularly meditate, if you start to look after your health, if you, if you, like you said, if you make that choice in your mind, and it is a choice, there's no difference between somebody that's a victim or somebody that's just free and successful. It's it's literally they make a choice in their mind yeah it's some situations like yours mine somebody else's might be a lot harder than others but it doesn't matter you know it is literally a choice and I love Jack Canfield's first chapter he says take full responsibility and I remember I was um I went into a shop in Thailand to buy some matcha tea I'm addicted to matcha I love it so I've gone in to buy some matcha tea and some lady just came in I've got like a sports motorbike a Yamaha and she came in and she was crying And I was just like, what's the matter? What's the matter? And she's like, Mr. Mr. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I reversed my car into your motorbike. And I'm like, chill, just take a breath. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And we go out, the motorbike's on the floor. There's something with the gears. There's a bit of plastic broken. She's trying to give me a phone number. She's in this really big panic. And I'm like, take a breath. Like, it's okay. To me, it's just a piece of metal. Yeah, it's a nice bike, but it's just a bit of metal. I don't own it. I'm borrowing it until I'm here. And then it's gone. I find out that it's like her wedding day the next day bless her so she's in a panic she's trying to buy all the last bits for her wedding she reverses into my motorbike and she's like take my number I'll pay for everything and I'm just like you're not paying for nothing don't worry about it and I drove off well I had to actually get the bike picked up the motorbike it cost me 150 quid or 100 quid whatever it was to get it fixed right I never rang her up for the money I never asked her for anything I didn't even contact her I just literally in that daily meditation I just sent her love and gratitude for coming into my life and just having a connection and I know it sounds crazy right but my whole point is just doing the complete opposite to what your ego would want to do. Oh, I start having an argument with her. Give me the money. You owe me the money for this. Getting stressed out because the motorbike's broken. And I thought, take full responsibility. Mm. I should have parked the motorbike on the other side of the road. (laughs) And it set me free. And that is how I apply my whole life. Because, yeah, if I park that that motorbike on the other side of the road, then she wouldn't have hit it. So that was me. And I think in relationships, we can do that. In business, we can do that. In our health, we can do that. Even though we might feel like it's so easy to judge or to say, no, it's their fault. You're the one that cheated on me. Or maybe they cheated on you because, you know, you didn't show affection over years. Or maybe it's not fair that I'm in a wheelchair. Maybe you was the one that stood on that ledge. It's my fault that I became a drug addiction. Maybe I shouldn't have experimented with smoking weed when I was a kid. If we take full responsibility, it doesn't change the shitty situation that we're stuck in. You still have these traumas. We still have this life. But what it does do is it sets you free internally. And to me, that is back to the inner game and the inner freedom. That's what it's all about for me. It's just freedom inside. And again, when you're free inside, it doesn't matter whether there's a pandemic or a riot in the world. None of it touches the side. It doesn't matter what people say to you when they project their anger on you or, or when people put their fears upon you because you're just free inside 
it doesn't really touch the sides. It's, it's okay. And then you can be free from your own mind games and your little monkey mind. I love that so much. I think that absolutely answers my question about kind of victim complex and things. When people see the bad hand they've been dealt, actually taking responsibility and it's your life. No one else has control over what happens to you, what choices you make, what job you do and things like that. You have responsibility. That's huge, I think. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so tell me, you, you live in Thailand now, right? Woohoo! Yes, I do on the I'm right, literally on the beach. Oh, that's just right incredible. Now. Tell me a bit more about what you do out there for work and things. Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned earlier, I published a book a few years back and um, that sold pretty okay around the world. And now I'm writing another book so I get to sit on the balcony. I have a kind of a, a an on and off relationship with writing. I can write for about a month or so and then I just need to take a month off. And so in between that, I do like one-to-one coaching with people and I help basically people yeah, take full responsibility, awaken to that higher power and then create a life they really, really want. And so I coach people one-to-one all around the world. And then I do yoga retreats and meditation retreats and teacher training. So because there's only one of me, I'm so passionate about sharing what I've learned. Uh, I'm training people up to share what I've learned. So we've got like a training on at the moment. We've got like 60 people yeah, learning how to be meditation teachers with like 10 methods that I've used. Again, stuff that's actually worked in my life and stuff that I've helped clients kind of use over like seven years. And now they're learning to do it and they'll become qualified coaches by me. I can't remember what I said. I think I said, I'm on fire to inspire. I'm just, this is my buzz. It's just to inspire yeah. people. But it's not just all online stuff as well. Like I went to Bangkok, Bangkok this weekend and I make sure that I take time out to speak to the person that's cleaning the toilet, the cleaner. I make sure I take time out to give the, the taxi driver a tip. I think we can get a little bit lost in this bubble of inspiring and influencing and all that you said, all the likes and Instagram. And sometimes, and I see it a lot this weekend and with some beautiful friends and they're so busy on their phone that they forget to thank the waiter that's just give them the food. Or they're so busy that they're just oblivious mm. to what's actually going on. And they're my friends and I love them dearly, but I'm like, we need to wake up on a day-to-day basis, not just talk about it. Because, you know, we can, yeah, we can still get lost in it. So, yeah. Mm, Absolutely. You're clearly so passionate about, I can't remember the phrase that you used, but basically inspiring other people and and helping others. And um, I can understand that. It's part, actually part of the programs that I teach. Like, first of all, wake up and realize you're programmed to do things that you don't want to do. Set yourself free. Then you kind of like, you still have all the stuff and you get these goals and these achievements. Achieve it and be successful, but you will never find a better buzz than serving other people or just helping and you don't need to be a mother Teresa or a Gandhi or somebody on a podcast being an influencer you can literally just go and read books to young kids or old people in a home I volunteered in hospices where people were dying I volunteered in drug and alcohol dropping centers when I was younger or when I started sorting myself out and it was the best buzz I've ever had and sometimes I make a shitload of money and it's okay don't get me wrong there's nothing wrong with making money but there's no better buzz than actually helping other people and I think that is the that's the big shift that we're seeing you know more and more people like yeah I'm doing all this stuff but why am I still unhappy yeah I've got the car I've got the family but why is there something missing and I actually do think it's part of Mm. human nature is to reach out and help each other um yeah I totally get it mate there is an absolute buzz for me. and your book honestly I've been listening to it and genuinely there is so much in there there's so much value every single page has another little nugget not even little nugget amazing nugget I want to share it with everyone it there's so it makes so much sense and I I'm literally sat there like in my car listening to it and I'm smiling and nodding because it's so much of it I get but there's so much more that I want to learn about and engage with so much of what you talk about so thank you for all that you do <laughs> incredible yeah. Okay, so something that I'm doing on this podcast, I mean, you've already given so much advice, but basically the idea is I'm interviewing people who have overcome huge challenge and adversity in their lives and finding out what piece of advice they can share for other people who might be facing challenges of their own. But if you were to give one thing, what would you say? Yeah, I think you're right. There's so many things that we could share with people. And I think just to make it really, really simple is just to commit to a daily meditation practice. Studies show that if you do an eight minute meditation practice every day for 30 days, apparently it changes the neurological pathways inside your mind. 
I guarantee if you just did an eight minute meditation every day for 30 days, you would feel like a different person. You would really would. The problem with meditation is that some people do it once or twice and they think that they can't meditate because they keep thinking or they have this myth that you're supposed to stop thinking. I never tell anybody to stop thinking. I never tell anybody that you've got to be perfect at meditation or sit cross leg like some guru. You know, I meditate when I'm on the toilet having a poop sometimes. So it's all good. You can meditate anywhere, right? But the biggest thing that I would say to anybody is consistency. Like my whole body is tingling because this is such a truth. It's consistency. If you just said to yourself at eight o'clock every morning before I go to that office that I don't want to go to or eight o'clock every morning before my anxiety kicks in at eight o'clock from now on, just eight minutes, I'm going to set my alarm before I even scroll on Instagram or whatever, just for eight minutes. And I'm not going to do it once or I'm not going to do it twice because I've listened to Sophie and Brett on a podcast. I'm actually going to do this and this is going to be a way of life for me. I guarantee you'll get to like two weeks and you'll probably want to do 20 minutes meditation this, I just can't express how phenomenal this would truly change your life. And I know it's not easy at the start. You know, I never enjoyed meditation at the start. I used to think meditation was about controlling your mind and changing yourself. Now I truly, truly understand that meditation is an opportunity to meet your real self. You're not the voices inside your head. You're not the identity and the roles that we play in society. You are a beautiful spark of energy. There's a, a love and a peace inside us, that goodness is inside us. And it seems that society has just kind of taken that away from us or we've got caught up. So meditation is an opportunity to meet who you really are. And when you meet who you really are, it's just the best relationship in the world, mate. So that's what I'd say. Not just meditate, but be consistent with it. And every day, and again, make it easy. Just say, okay, eight o'clock, eight minutes, done. Easy, simple. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> this is this is incredible, Brett. Ah, oh, just, I feel, yeah, I don't know. My heart feels full right now, you know. There's just, yeah, so much goodness. It's incredible. Oh, amazing. Just finally, if people want to find out more about you, where where should they Yeah, head? yeah, you can go on Instagram. So it's Brett Moran underscore B R E double T M O R A N underscore. And I've got a Brett Moran website and the yoga company, which is they can get free meditations or do online meditation courses. If they find it hard to do the eight minute meditation, they can download one of my courses. And I literally, I give them the eight minute meditation. You just listen to it. And then the second week, they go to like 16 minutes and we just up it till they've got a nice daily consistent practice and that website i'm just double checking it's called bodhi b-o-d-h-i bodhi yoga thailand and that's got all of the retreats the trainings and the and the and the apps and stuff like that so yeah and anyone can message me and just send me a private message i'm so open to helping people and just replying i like, i thrive off of this stuff so please don't be shy to to just reach out and just say you know i'm struggling or whatever whatever yeah just definitely message me and your book yeah my book is called wake the fuck up which is f hashtag ck and you can find that on amazon or i think barnes and noble you find it online or on my website brett moran incredible incredible and genuinely like i said before you know your instagram lives uh, meditations in the morning nine o'clock right Yes, yeah, yeah, nine o'clock every Monday to Friday. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for doing this. I appreciate it so much. Honestly, mate, I feel very humbled to be listening to your story and very honoured that you invited me to this. So I'd love to stay in contact and maybe do some more later down the line or when I get my one back up and running, I'd love to interview you for your story. So thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Oh, amazing, amazing. (laughs) All right, cool. I'll speak to you soon. Love you loads. Have an amazing day. Bye. Thanks for listening today. If you like what you heard, please be sure to share it with anyone you think would like it and rate, review and subscribe because this helps it get in front of more people who might enjoy and even benefit from it. My guest next week is the phenomenal athlete, David Smith, MBE, whose story is not one to be missed. So hopefully see you next time. Thanks for listening.